Uh, my name's Jenny. My son is Jax. He's eight years old. He has vanishing white matter disease. He was diagnosed at one and a half. 2019 was a really bad year for us as a family, and we spent a lot of time in the hospital and visited the emergency room quite a bit. So over that time, while I was there, I started to formulate in my head how, the, how can this be done better? Because we were running into the same problems, the same complications over and over and over again. So even though I thought we had the same doctors treating us, wouldn't they remember what they did last time and avoid those same mistakes? But nope, nope, we just had the same thing happen over and over again. So um, one good thing though that our doctors did do was to write up a, an emergency letter. So um, I have been tinkering with it and I'll show it to you all who haven't seen it um, at the end of the presentation. All right, so here we go. So we are going to talk about indications for a visit to the emergency room. And I like to use those medical terms. Indications means reasons to go to the emergency room. So I just started nursing school and I'm learning the medical vocabulary. So we'll talk about the indications. We'll talk about what to expect. We'll talk about planning ahead. Um, we're not actually going to talk about hospital admissions. We can if you want to. And then we'll talk about mitigating risk and avoiding complications and avoiding the hospital to avoid some of the complications that can happen there. All right. Um, oh, dang it. Okay, so what are some reasons that we might take our affected person to the ER? Or what are some reasons why you have in the past? Seizures. Good. Anyone else have any reasons? What's that? Sam had a concussion. We've been there too. Yes. So let me show you what I came up with. This is not exhaustive, but this is what I could brainstorm. So viral illnesses, bacterial infections, physical trauma, like a concussion, seizures, and then I have like unresolved pain. So maybe we don't know what's going on and we need quick answers so we go so that we can troubleshoot and get tested for things. So out of all of these, I haven't really dealt with the seizures so much. I have dealt with the physical trauma I've dealt with the viral illness, and then as a result of the viral illness, we've had some bacterial infection complications like pneumonia. So when we talk about viral illness, some of the risks for complications are listed over here on the left. Dehydration, malnutrition, and respiratory distress. So we'll go through and talk about how we can mitigate those risks and how we can intervene to prevent more serious complications. All right, so what do these people look like to you? Tired? Anything else? Dehydrated. <laughs> yes, so dehydration is a big factor, I realized, in complications. And I did not realize, even for myself, how dehydrated I am sometimes. A lot of times headaches, it's dehydration. Um, and for Jax, oh, this is a fun fact. For Jax, um, I feel like he appeared more, like I attribute a lot of dehydration symptoms to just, oh, it's leukodystrophy or vanishing white matter disease. So I, I will tell you that since he's had a G-tube and we've kept him hydrated, I haven't seen him wilt during illness. Before he would kind of, 
he would just kind of not be completely unresponsive, but he wouldn't open his eyes. He'd be laying in bed, not moving. That hasn't happened since he's had his G-tube and we've been able to keep him hydrated. So in hindsight, because, you know, maybe he wasn't able to take in enough fluid, he got very lethargic. And so that's attributed to dehydration and not necessarily leukodystrophy or vanishing white matter disease. So water makes up 60% of our bodies and it does a lot of good things for us and that is why we need it. We can only survive three days without it. Um, specifically, it carries nutrients, so like our blood supply. Um, it flushes bacteria from your bladder, so sometimes you're at increased risk for UTIs. It aids in digestion. You need water to digest your food, prevents constipation, normalizes blood pressure, cushions your joints. I think that's a big thing. Protects your organs and your tissues, regulates your body temperature, and maintains your electrolyte balance. So when we are looking at our affected person and say they have a viral illness and we're assessing whether or not we need to take them into the ER, these are some things we can look for. Um, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, and decreased fluid intake can all contribute to causing dehydration. Now the symptoms that we can look at, which we just talked about for kids, unusually sleepy or drowsy, and that was a big thing I feel like for my son, is just getting very lethargic. Um, the other thing is like dry diapers. So maybe they're not peeing anymore. Um, for adults, it's like headache, dizziness, confusion, obviously feeling thirsty, weakness, concentrated urine. And then there's also um, the clinical manifestations of dehydration. So these are the things that medical professionals look for, for dehydration. They look at the color of your skin. They look at how um, like flexible your skin is. They look to see how your mouth, is it dry, is it moist? Your eyes, are they sunken? For infants, the fontanelle, if that is sunken. Obviously we talked about behavior. When you're dehydrated, your pulse goes up and it's not as strong, it's very weak because you don't have as much blood volume. So I think your heart is compensating by beating faster. And then your blood pressure goes lower because you don't have as much blood volume when you're dehydrated. And your respirations, which is your breathing rate, becomes more rapid. And the same thing, it's because it's trying to compensate for that decreased fluid and blood volume. So some handy tools I like to have on hand is a pulse oximeter, which you can buy at any local Walgreens or CVS or Amazon, and the automatic blood pressure cuff. Um, and then obviously a thermometer is good too. So, so the pulse oximeter is that thing on the left of the two pictures, and it checks how oxygenated your blood is. So that's super helpful. Um, it also does your your pulse, so you can check your person's um, vitals, and that can give you an indicator as to how severe they are. And then also the blood pressure. If you know their normal blood pressure values, you can check to see if there's a change. And then this is an interesting one with the hands there. After you pinch your hand, this is called skin turgor. Yeah, I see you guys trying it now. <laughs> are you guys dehydrated? So if you pinch it and it doesn't go back right away, you're dehydrated and you need to drink some more water. I don't know if this works as well on kids because they seem to have really nice skin for the most part, but I definitely know for me, like sometimes mine will stick up or it'll be a little bit slow to go back. So that is a really good test. All right. So some interventions we can do for our, um, dehydration is if they're vomiting a lot and that's the cause of the dehydration is to have anti-nausea meds on hand. So there's medications. The main one that's really amazing is Zofran and its generic name is like Ondanacitron or something like that. So that actually works really well so that they can start keeping fluids down. Mm -hmm. No, you need to have a prescription for this. So one reason you might go to the ER is to get this medication. 
if you wanted to stay out of the ER, you could have it on hand. So if you have like a palliative care doctor or even your pediatrician could write you a prescription to use as needed. So usually it's like one, one tablet every eight hours or something like that. And then the other thing you can do when you go into the hospital is to receive the IV fluids. And so that'll have like the water and the electrolytes. One risk is when you're already dehydrated and you're giving a lot of fluid back, but not replacing the electrolytes, is that you can cause those like electrolyte imbalances. So that's what's really beneficial with the IV fluids. Whoops, hold on. Okay, so the next complication that, or the next bad thing that you can be at risk for with a viral illness is malnutrition. So this is when, you know, the patient is feeling uh, sick, so they don't feel like eating, or maybe they're tired or, you know, dehydrated, so they're sleepy and they're not eating. Or a lot of times with leukodystrophies, this dysphagia, I think that means like inability to swallow. So maybe they're just not a, able to take in large amounts of food. And then also when you're sick, sometimes you have increased energy requirements. So this is kind of controversial. So I, I went to a bunch of different sources online and the general consensus is that feeding should start within the first 48 hours after admission. So if you were to go to the ER, you would wanna make sure that you start feeding your child. So if they're not able to eat by mouth, there's ways that you can feed them. And so we'll talk about that. I will say that I think, again, one of the biggest complications with Jack's the very first time um, he was in the hospital for a viral illness is we forgot to feed him. And one day the nurse was like, you know what? He hasn't eaten for a while. Like maybe, maybe we should give him some food. And I really think that sent him downhill fast. So I always, you know, hindsight is 2020, and I always wonder, had we been more on top of that, would he have experienced such terrible complications? So let's keep going. Another website said that timely implementation of nutritional support has been linked with favorable outcomes, such as a decrease in length of hospital stay, reduced mortality, and reductions in the rate of severe complications. So I... I believe that, I've seen that with Jax. Um, there is controversy concerning like how much to feed. And it seems like the general consensus is, is you don't wanna overfeed the patient in the beginning, especially within the first week of acute illness. That can actually make things worse. So you don't wanna be giving them um, like their normal caloric needs. Something about their metabolism. <laughs> I'm glad there aren't any real medical people here watching this. So, so providing early high protein while avoiding early energy overfeeding might be a beneficial nutritional strategy. And specifically for vanishing white matter disease, we know that Dr. Vandernap has recommended avoiding amino acid starvation, which is protein. So specifically for that type of leukodystrophy, uh, this makes sense, providing early high protein while avoiding the energy overfeeding. And then contraindications for um, feeding early on is if they're not already, they call this hemodynamically unstable. Um, so that means that you know, their blood pressure isn't stable and maybe they're not fully hydrated yet. So you usually wanna hydrate the person first before you start feeding them. So it's important that they are hydrated. Okay, so what are the interventions for feeding someone when they're in the hospital or at home when they're sick and they're, they are una they're unable to eat by mouth? So if they don't already have a G-tube, they have something called a nasogastric tube, which is a tube that goes up through your mouth, or mouth, nose. <laughs> Margaret knows, where's Aoife? She would be perfect example here. So it goes up through your nose and then it goes down your throat and into your stomach. And so you're able to feed the patient that way while maybe they're not themselves or they're not 
conscious or maybe they're not safe to be eating. Um, the other way is if, okay, so that type of nutrition is called enteral nutrition. So if they don't tolerate enteral nutrition, then the other option, which is less preferred, would be parenteral nutri nutrition. And this is nutrition through your veins. So the first one we'll talk about is the nasogastric tube or enteral nutrition. Here's a picture of that tube so you can see where it goes down to the stomach. Here's a picture of a little boy. They'll usually tape it to their face. And then you can either um, use a syringe to put in the food or a, or a feeding pump. So you would want to use a nasogastric tube if you aren't getting adequate nutrition from oral feeding. So we kind of already talked about this. And then the next question is what to feed. So there are many formulas to choose from. And in general, this is my recommendation, would be to choose one that is easy to digest during acute illness. So with Jax, I was like, you know what? I'm not giving him anything that's like chemicals or like, you know, formulated in a lab. We're giving him, it's called Nourish, but it's basically like blended up sweet potatoes and kale, you know? But when he was that sick, it was really hard on his digestion to digest that heavy, real food. So they actually have formulas that are broken down to their basic elements and are easy to digest. So I don't have the information as far as the names of any of those formulas, but I, I know they exist and we've used them in the hospital. So they're, they're usually called like elemental or peptide formulas. So it'd be very easy to digest. Um, and then we're, there we are again saying uh, some, some evidence suggests that a high protein diet is associated with better outcomes. So they even have formulas that have different macronutrient breakdowns. And so there's some that may be a little higher protein than other formulas. So that would just be something you would talk to the dietitian about. And then also a lot of the literature was suggesting a caloric intake of 70 to 80% of their normal requirements during the first three days of illness. So that, that applies to that overfeeding we were talking about. We don't wanna overload them with food in the beginning. And then here's a, just a summary of um, these recommendations. So enteral nutrition should be started within the first 48 hours if an oral diet is not possible and if it's not contraindicated. Early feeding should always be below the actual energy expenditure. And that, there's some controversy about that. This is just this particular uh, medical journal and there's a lot that agree with them and others that aren't sure. Um, some think you should wait a full seven days before you start feeding a patient, but most of them seem to think it was a good thing to start feeding them. Um, full energy requirements should be gradually achieved by day four. Limit the period of fasting. Um, so they, they think that you should really get up to the calories you need by day four. And sometimes if they're not up to that or they're not tolerating the enteral nutrition, then that's when you would, you could either supplement with the parenteral nutrition through your vein or you could um, do it exclusively. All right, so now we'll talk about intravenously uh, being fed, parent, parenteral nutrition. All right, so this is what it looks like, because I didn't know this before the hospital, and maybe you guys are smarter than me and know this stuff already, but there's PPN and there's TPN. So PPN is partial parenteral nutrition, and that is given through your arm. So it doesn't meet your full caloric needs. Um, so it's a little more watered down and they do it in a peripheral vein. Um, so total parenteral nutrition is usually used for more long-term cases. Um, and because it has more nutrients in it, it's thicker. And so it has to go through a bigger vein. So they will actually place a central line that goes, you can see it there, goes straight to your heart. Um, and now, obviously, with, with feeding intravenous, intravenously, there's a risk for infection. And these are very, like, sterile procedures to insert these catheters into your vein. And so there is a high risk of infection, which could cause complications. So that's why the enteral nutrition is usually preferred. 
Um, so you would use this type of nutrition when you're not tolerating food in your stomach, either by mouth or by NG tube or by G tube. So some of those um, contraindications, which we've experienced with Jack's as well, is like delayed gastric emptying. That means your stomach isn't processing the food. The food is just sitting there. Um, another thing is like constipation. So sometimes a lot of the meds that they're on as well will slow down your bowels and cause constipation. And then you have like bowel paralysis. So since these are leukodystrophies, maybe they're experiencing some sort of like neurological dysfunction when they're sick and under high stress conditions. And then this is an interesting one, the hemorrhage, which we've experienced as well. But apparently it's very common for patients in general, not just leukodystrophy patients who are in the ICU. It, in fact, it's common practice that our children's hospital is to put them on an antacid or a PPI like omeprazole to prevent stress ulcers while you're in the hospital. So they found that actually a lot of patients in the ICU will develop stress ulcers just because it's stressful for your body to be in the ICU. So we've noticed that with Jax is he'll start, his stomach will start bleeding and he won't tolerate the food. And we can see, well, with his G-tube, it'll be like brown coming out. And so those have been the cases where we've had to use like the PPN or the TPN. And it's been interesting because as I watch on Facebook, I've seen other patients go through the same thing where they're like, what's this brown stuff coming out? And I'm like, ah, it's blood. So it seems to be, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say super common, but you know, it's not, it's not unheard of. So that's something that with Jax, I want in his emergency letter, the fact that they need to watch out that he might be getting these ulcers, these bleeding ulcers in his stomach. All right, so this is what the TPN looks like. There's two bags. One bag has dextrose, amino acids, and electrolytes, and the other bag has lipids, which are fats. So they'll hang them both up and they'll feed it through the vein. Now, the interesting thing about TPN that I didn't realize before we had to use it is that it's specially formulated for that patient. So it's not something that they can just pull off the shelf and give to the patient. They actually have to work with a dietitian and the pharmacist to customize it for the patient. So a lot of times it's, it takes like 24 hours before you can get it. So with vanishing white matter disease, you know, when they say avoid amino acid starvation, give within 24 hours, that kind of freaked me out because they said, well, the pharmacy isn't going to have it ready for another 24 hours. So, so that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, but I, I've, I'm not positive how this works for the parenteral nutrition, but Margaret, I think you said you can still give the amino acid portion. Um, without the lipids, and so I wonder if that would cut down the time that they needed to, you know, make, make the TPN, PPN formulas. And then also there are risks for this besides the risk of infection is they just need to make sure you're not having any like hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia because it is a delicate balance that they're just putting things straight into your blood. You know, it's, you, it's bypassing your digestive system completely. And then here's a picture of the bags that Jax had in the hospital. I, took, I take a picture, I take pictures of everything in the hospital <laughs> just so, so I can look at it later and be like, what did he get or what, what are they doing? So anyways, these are his actual bags that he had. The left one are the amino acids, so it's kind of like an, a yellowish color and it has the dextrose and the fluids in it. The right side is, are the lipids. And that is not a white sticker down at the bottom. That's not the color of the bag. That's the color of the lipids inside. So it's actually white. And, and it seems to, that seems to be the one that's like really thick. Um, all right, so does anyone want to talk about that anymore before I go on to the next thing? Mm -hmm. What's the waste product? So it's, it's the same because ultimately when you're fed through your digestive tract, um, the nutrients are absorbed into your blood. Hmm. You know what? That's actually a really good question. I, 
they're still excreting waste. It's probably just more liquidy, yeah, because you don't have the fiber and things. But you know, your the food that you're using ends up in your blood, and same thing, the waste that your body has is in the blood and then filters through everything and comes out. So I imagine, like you said, it's probably just more liquidy. But that is a really good question because it's not going through your GI tract. So it's like, how, how does it come out? <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, you probably know that. So the, the doctors always say for someone who's still eating by mouth, popsicles, watermelon, things like that that have a high water content are good for hydration. Oh, otter pops? They have like a Pedialyte version of otter pops too. So, oh yeah, yeah, let me get to her real fast, okay. If your child needs an NG tube, be aware that they should have it no longer than two months or it'll cause future long-term swallowing gagging problems. It will eliminate their gag and then um, in the future, you're going to have problems. So if they need it for two months, get the G-tube immediately. Okay, great. I appreciate that recommendation. Yeah, there's definitely things that are like a temporary fix, but if they end up needing it longer, you can do a more permanent solution that's not as like rough on the body. So, so like with NG tubes, you would move to a G-tube. With um, being intubated when you're having respiratory distress, you would get a tracheostomy. So there's uh, different things that are better for short-term and temporary versus long-term and, and permanent. So that's a really great comment. All right, go ahead. Oh, okay. So one of the questions is, is can the IV solution for TPN be prepared ahead of time? Is that right? Okay. So that actually is a good question that I have as well. Um, what I've been told by our doctors is that for TPN and PPN, your requirements could be different on different days and different times based on whatever your current blood levels are. So I would say they would say no, it can't be prepared ahead of time. Also, I'm not sure how long it's good for. But I think the main thing is, is that they customize it to your blood tests and your blood work. Now, I wonder though, is there something at least that you could give them like some sort of generic amino acids? And that would be a really good question to find out. Um, and then another thing too, as far as um, fluids, one thing that I do like, if you do have a G-tube, there's those banana bags. So they have uh, dehydration fluids in the hospital called a banana bag that has uh, glucose or dextrose, I guess, and minerals. But you can buy it on Amazon and it's an oral version. And so I will dump that down Jax's G-tube and I'll notice immediately he'll perk up. So that is a really great thing to have on hand. It, especially if they're tolerating fluids, you can prevent a trip to the hospital. All right, so uh, with viral illness, we're also at risk for respiratory distress, which is, they, like, they always like to say this in the hospital, increased work of breathing. So signs of respiratory distress are an increase in the number of breaths per minute that you take, so that's called their respiration rate, so they're breathing faster, 
Um, maybe their extremities, their lips, their nose, their fingernails start, or yeah, their mouth start turning a bluish color. That's evidence of like uh, bad oxygenation. Another thing they always say to look for is your like nose flaring because they, they feel like they can't get enough oxygen. Um, also, they want you to look at the chest and the ribs to see if they're having contractures, contra retractions, which just means like you can see the skin pulling in over the ribs. And actually, I have a picture of that right here. So retraction. So you can see like a normal person breathing as opposed to when they're having trouble breathing and they're kind of gasping for air. You can see their ribs or you can see underneath their ribs like that. So that's a really huge sign that some respiratory distress is going on. And then for oxygen saturation, we've been told by our doctors that for Jacks to administer supplemental oxygen if his oxygen saturation falls below 94. So normal for a person is between 95 and 100. Um, but if they're obviously having some distress, you would want to get them to the hospital because it's not going to stay at that 94, 93. It could quickly turn around and go, and go down, and they could be well below 90. So I thought this was interesting. Respiratory pathways affecting carbon dioxide elimination. So one thing is we, we can measure oxygen saturation really easily with that little pulse oximeter. What we can't measure as easily is carbon dioxide output. So we can measure how much oxygen is coming in, but we, it's very difficult to measure without like a blood test your, um, your carbon dioxide. So there needs to be a balance. So sometimes you can have decent oxygen saturation, but sh your blood is actually acidic because you're not expelling enough carbon dioxide. So that's another thing that they can do in the hospital. Um, I have seen things online that are very expensive that you can check at home for carbon dioxide levels, but, um, but like I said, it's expensive. So, so anyway, so respiratory pathways affecting carbon dioxide elimination, I think especially applicable to leukodystrophy is your central nervous system. That means you won't breathe. The person won't breathe. Like their brain is just not telling them to breathe. Um, but then there's these other things with the respiratory muscles, they just can't breathe, like they're getting fatigued and they just can't expand their lungs enough to get enough air in. And then with the lungs, this abnormal gas exchange, they can't breathe enough. I imagine that's more like if you have pneumonia, maybe your lung capacity isn't um, as good. And so the normal exchange that takes place when you take an oxygen and expel the carbon dioxide can't take place as well as it needs to. So the interventions for respiratory distress, there's different levels. So obviously the first one is this oxygen supplementation. Now one thing that um, they caution over and over again in the literature is you don't wanna supplement with oxygen if they're actually in acute respiratory distress because then you're just loading them with oxygen but you're not getting rid of the carbon dioxide. So oxygen can help them breathe a little bit easier, but if, it, if they're needing it for a long time, you might want to move to something else. So they have this other thing called high flow oxy oxygen. They have non-invasive ventilation and they have invasive mechanical ventilation. So the ventilation is when, the, when you're getting assistance with the breathing. So in the hospital, what they'll test for for oxygen They'll use the pulse oximeter, which you can also use at home, but the thing that you can't do at home is they can do this arterial blood gas test. And that's the test that they use to measure the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your blood. So it says it's the most accurate method for determining lung function. And then there's also like physical tests you can do, but I don't believe they would do that in the ER so much, um, you know, when you're there for an acute illness. So here's a picture of Jack's receiving high flow oxygen. So usually, um, at least this high flow oxygen was humidified and it was warm. So I think that must help with um, making it easier to breathe. Um, and then here is some non-invasive ventilation examples. So he, he, ha he was 
having an EEG at the time, that's what the helmet is, but I could not help but think he looked like a football player, a pilot, and a scuba diver. Like, <laughs> poor Jax, we're like taking pictures of him while he's going through this. But the first one on the left, I think is like a high, another high flow oxygen. The one in the middle and the one on the right are both like a BiPAP, which means that it's, um, it's helping you breathe. Kind of like the CPAP, I think, where when he takes a breath, it triggers it to like push in the air so that he gets more than he normally could on his own. So that's what that is. And those are really difficult for kids to tolerate, actually. He was pretty like comatose at this point, so it didn't matter. But, but I imagine a kid would not like having those things on their faces. But he was able to get through and avoid intub intubation on this particular hospital visit because he was tolerating the BiPAP. Now, if, if not, um, sometimes they need to be a little more invasive, and then that's when you would have the, the intubation and the tracheostomy. So there's Jax right after he had gotten his tracheostomy with his sister. So you can see he's a super happy kid to have that tube out of his mouth. So the, the ventilator then provides humidification, but it also provides the breathing for you. And there's different settings. So it can be programmed like the BiPAP, where it just gives you some breaths when you need it, or it can actually do the full-on breathing for you. So that is the most extreme. And if you ever get to this point, the doctors are going to make sure you know what you're getting into, because this is a very, like... This is one of those pathways that you reach where they say, you know, your life is going to change when your son gets on a ventilator. Like, are you up for the amount of work and stress that this is going to take? And so that's really, a, you know, obviously a family decision. And my husband and I, when we were at this point, we went both ways, back and forth, back and forth. But ultimately you look at your kid and you, you will know the right thing to do. And for us, for Jax, we knew he wasn't done yet. And so we decided to get to the trach and afterwards I just felt like so much peace. So I knew I did the right decision. And from, from then on actually, once he recovered from his illness, we were able to remove the ventilator. So now he just has the trach. All right, so any questions on all the respiratory stuff? Uh-huh. That's a good question that I don't, don't know the answer to for sure, but I do know that warm and cold have different uses. So I will find out. <laughs> Does anyone else know the answer to that? Warm versus cool hum humidification and when to use each one? Uh-huh. I, I know that cold can help with strider because it happened that I had a severe attack. Ambulance came. It was um, January and it was fro freezing out by the time we get got to the hospital, it was gone, and they said, you had strider, you go out in the cold, it helps settle it down. Hmm. I don't know how to apply that to anything else. Yeah. Um, usually you need heated humidification because your lungs don't like, it, it needs to be same temperature um, if, if you're doing ventilator. And while I'm at it here, I would like to tell you about something that's not very well known at all. Um, we chose to have our sons get trached with a total tracheal separation because they were aspirating their saliva with every breath. And it was either a choice of um, hospice or this was introduced to us by a guy, a doctor who um, did specialize different things. Um, because in our kids, a regular trach still doesn't stop aspiration. It can um, actually increase aspiration because there's an irritant in the throat. And you can still have the same problems. You just have access. But a tracheal separation means they cut the trachea off, turn it here, sew it here. And this is their only airway, and there's nothing left to attach to the mouth or nose. Um, 
there's advantages, disadvantages. The biggest disadvantage is you lose their voice. They will never make another sound again. And that was really tough on our second son because he made a lot of noises. Our, our other son never made noises. He just cried, so it was easier to decide. But it was very hard um, to decide on our other son that we lost his laugh and his noises and his the fun things. But you know what? We still see him laugh. We just don't hear it. Um, but that, um, and you use laryngectomy supplies in laryngectomy protocols. That's what people get when they have voice box cancer and their larynx is removed. It's a similar surgery. Um, that, that Once that's removed, they have to breathe somehow, so they put a hole here. And the one good thing about this hole in, in the total laryngectomy or um, tr uh, tracheal separation is it's completely stable. It's not an emergency. You can take your tube out and walk away. They can breathe um, because it's completely stable. Um, that is an advantage. But I want you to be aware when you need that. Many of our families are going to face that choice of a trach. Um, this is a, a different way of doing it. You'll find no one knows about it. You'll fight your insurance companies for supplies. Um, you'll find they go to the hospital and the nurses say, I have no idea what to do to that. Um, even the hospital that did it, very few people knew how to do with it, deal with it. Um, so you gotta teach people over and over again, but it is, it's an alternative to consider my kids I've never can't aspirate ever again, and we started feeding them again because they couldn't aspirate and they can eat again um, safely. Um, there's there's advantages disadvantages, but you do lose the voice. Yeah, when Jax um, got his trach, I mean, they did tell us it goes below the vocal cords, but it was really devastating to not be able to hear him. Um, so that, that is one thing that is, <laughs> it is really hard. Um, so, but uh, once they get used to the trach, they can put on a speaking valve, even with someone on a ventilator, so that um, when they breathe in, it's through the trach, but when they breathe out, it goes up past the vocal cords and out uh, through your nose and mouth, and so they're able to make noise. So right now, Jax, that's how he makes noise during the day, is we have a speaking valve on, and he can laugh, he can cry, and do all of that. But the huge advantage, what she's talking about, is the aspiration. So that is a great segue into the next slide here. Bacterial infection, and a common, common infection for kids with uh, neuro disabilities and muscular problems is aspiration pneumonia. So this is when um, their secretions or whatever they're eating or maybe they vomit gets into their lungs and they're not able to get it out and it causes an infection. And so this is something serious that can cause a lot of complications and a lot of people can, um, if, it, if it's bad enough, maybe they don't have the energy reserves to get over it. So, um, so this is a, 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 I, a I guess what she was talking about would be an intervention to avoid the trauma and complications that come with aspiration pneumonia. So, and then another common infection that I've heard a lot about for um, emergency room visits are these uh, UTIs or urinary tract infection. So the risk for getting a UTI is from incontinence. So like if they're sitting in their stool, you know, that can obviously increase your risk of UTI. Also using a catheter. So sometimes as the uh, patients progress, they lose control over their sphincters and it becomes difficult for them to pee. And so they start retaining urine. So you have to end up using a catheter to get the urine out. And whenever you introduce something into the bladder, that brings more germs and increases your risk for infection. So those are, I know um, one person in particular, her daughter has a lot of problems with these UTIs. And when, especially with vanishing white matter disease, I'm not sure about other leukodystrophies, but when they have an infection, even something as small as a UTI, it can cause them to deteriorate and they get more shaky or they get more sleepy 
or you know, it, um, it can be serious even though it's just a UTI. So that's one thing that I want to research a little bit more. Yes, because... So, uh, so I feel like that's just something that's not on there that we all feel like. Yes, that is a really, that's a really good uh, comment. So a lot of times there's a neurogenic bladder, which has to do with um, the muscle control. But also what Jax has experienced, and probably Sam, is that when they're constipated, it's pressing on that sphincter or whatever, and so they aren't able to have a BM. So, so far for Jax, the only time we've had to use a catheter is when he's been constipated. And once the constipation resolves, he starts peeing again by himself. So, so yeah, so that can be another risk for the UTI is, is just not being able to pee because you're constipated. And, and the crazy thing with constipation is like, it's not that it's hard per se, it's just there's a large load and their muscles aren't pushing it out. So it's just sitting there. All right, so the treatment for pneumonia and urinary tract infections that I see is a huge advantage being in the hospital is being able to test and culture um, the secretions and the urine. Because when they take a culture and a specimen, they're able to figure out what type of antibiotics the infection is sensitive to and so that you can uh, treat it the most effectively and efficiently. So, and the other thing that they have in the hospital that you can't do at home are these IV antibiotics. So there's some antibiotics that you can give via uh, your IV, and I don't know if they're like stronger or they work faster, but that's another option when you're in the hospital. Okay. All right, and then this other section too that's a little bit, has a lot of information, but it's, um, I feel like it, we haven't dealt with it as much, so I don't have as much information on this slide, but um, physical trauma. So, so we also know that kids with leukodystrophy and, and when you become more immobile, you're at risk for decreased bone density, which means your bones break more easily. So a lot of times we'll have kids or patients that you know, get fractures just by doing nothing. And so that can be a reason you know, of like, um, unknown source of pain and maybe they end up having like a hip dislocation or a fracture. So that is something that you would obviously treat in the hospital. Now, the other thing that was confusing to me too is if my son fell and hit his head and he has a bruise on his head, if I go to the hospital, what are they, are they really going to be able to do anything for him? There's no treatment for that. So the main thing with the concussions is you would just get imaging to make sure there's no bleeding. That, that would be the reason to go to the hospital. And then the other last reason would be the status epilepticus. So if you're having seizures and you can't stop them, go to the hospital. So um, that would be another thing to put in your emergency letter and also um, in your emergency plan. Doctor, when do I take my person to the hospital when they're having a seizure. And for, you know, once their seizure history is known, a lot of times they'll say, if it hasn't stopped in, Margaret, what do they tell you? Like 30 seconds, a minute? I don't know. Or does it depend? Five minutes. Five minutes. Excuse me, five minutes, but I usually three minutes. Okay, so, so for instance, for Margaret, if, if, uh, Aoife's having a seizure and it's not done in three minutes, she's already calling the ambulance and taking her to the hospital. Oh, you just do your PRN med. Okay, so that's another thing that can keep you out of the hospital is to have your medications on hand that can stop the seizure. But if you've exhausted all those options and they're still seizing, take them to the hospital. And so then they can do uh, all sorts of crazy things to try to get them to stop. Is it time to go? Okay. So let me just show you real quick. This is Benjamin Franklin. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound in cure. So if we can plan ahead and for all of these situations, just like emergency disaster planning, um, we can prevent a lot of complications that, and avoid a lot of um, pain and hurt. So we have the letters and 
these are the things that would be good to have on the letter. Basically, anything you think that someone that doesn't know your child would need to know when they go to the ER. And so here's Jax's letter. And so the important things for him that I have on there, and you obviously have their name, their date of birth, their medical record number, the contact information for their doctors. So our doctor uh, was the one that actually created the letter, and then over the years, I've kind of customized it and gotten him to sign off. So this is something you can do with your doctor and also do through email, too. I just emailed him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth till I got it how I liked it, and he approved it. Um, same thing with Dr. Vandernap. I even sent it to her, and she you know, made some changes and recommendations. So you can do that uh, through email or at your doctor's visits. Now, um, so for Jax, it's important for him to keep his uh, you know, temperature low so he doesn't have a fever. It's also important because he has these gastric ulcers that if you're going to decrease the fever and give meds, to try to use something other than ibuprofen first because he has that risk of gastric bleeding. Um, so, so little quirks like that about your kid you'll want to have in the emergency letter. And so I have the other things that have been recommended by Dr. Vandernat for vanishing white matter disease. But and other things I would want to include would be like the question that someone had about the fluids, like what type of fluids to give when they're dehydrated. So all of these different scenarios, pre-planned, maybe what to test for, what their normal values are for testing, and what to do based on you know, different lab values. So you can even include like relevant test results um, or imaging. And then also I have on here like contraindications. So, so for instance, for Jax, we know with vanishing white matter disease, try to avoid these medications. So I have those on there. Um, and then also the medication list. So this is something, <laughs> when, you go to the, when you go to the ER, they want to know all of your medications, when you give them, why you're giving them, and then they ask you about five more times for five different people. So I made, a list and I take it with me or I have it on my phone and I can email it to them and they can print it off. But I have the medication, the dose, the concentration, the indication, what it's used for, who prescribed it, and when it's scheduled. And so I, as long as I keep this updated, I can just take it and say, here, <laughs> stop asking me all these questions because there's a long list of meds and it's going to take us some time. So, so this is really helpful. And that is actually all I have for you. I had, I had my daughter take some pictures real quick of our supply closet. So if you have equipment and supplies at home, that's one way you can avoid the ER. So I've definitely noticed the last three and a half years, we haven't really had to go to the ER because we've had so much support at home. We have this uh, suction machine, the nebulizer for breathing treatments, the pulse oximeter to measure his um, oxygen saturation and his heart rate. We have supplemental oxygen, so we can turn on this machine and he can get oxygen if he needs it for whatever reason. Um, there's even an oxygen tank in the closet in the lower left. I don't know if you can see it, but then we have all of our supplies and I can see what we have and what we need to order. And so that's actually been huge to have all of this stuff at home. And then this is just a little FYI thing that I thought was important to know, um, the normal values for all of the different vital signs. And that is all I have for you today. So thank you for participating. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, yeah. No, there's actually something for vanishing white matter disease. That, that something you can find pretty easy online? Uh, no. <laughs> no, but we have a copy of this letter, and we will email it to you, and you can customize it. Yep, I've got the letter. I just, I'm just more curious about the medicines that, that we need to try to maybe avoid. Yeah. Yeah, the sevoflurane, which is on there. And then those other three are antibiotics that aren't used very often. Okay. But what you need to do is put them as an allergy in their medical chart so that the doctors will never prescribe them. So when they try to prescribe something, it'll alert 
That's a good call. We started out on some, it's a seizure medicine, and I apologize, I cannot think of the name of it, but it was a very bad call. And so we decided to take them off. That's actually what they mentioned. I think it was Keppra, and they mentioned maybe next time happen to try vitamin B with it. Yes, it is much better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to put that together so that it's available. And one thing with vanishing white matter disease in particular is, it, at least for Jax, um, I've only seen him have a seizure when he's acutely ill in the hospital. Yes. And so I think. I think it's easy to overtreat seizures, but at the same time, you know, a seizure is a high risk for a decline. But seeing your child, like, and how functional he is, I wouldn't think that would be too much of a worry yet, based on yeah. other vanishing white matter disease patients. Yeah. Go ahead. Not bad seizures, though. Oh, yes. And since the hospital is 250 miles away, we can get something that's hard to go back home and get it. Have pre-packed bags of everything you can, of your supplies and stuff you're going to take that are just ready to grab. And then a list of the very few things you need the day of. Yes. That, that is really great advice. I, 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 I was thinking about putting a slide in there. I forgot. Oh, yeah. So what she's recommending, you know, when... Uh, when someone gives birth and they have their to-go bag for whenever they go into labor. Same thing for your child. If they need an ER visit, you can have extra clothes, supplies, medications from home. That's another thing too with the hospital. If, if, we, if we went on to like uh, managing hospital visits, like hospital admissions, is using your home uh, supplements and medications that they don't have in the hospital. So for instance, we had a palliative care doctor that let me use our liquid glycerin suppositories that work really well for Jax instead of their little ones that don't. So, uh huh. Pharmacy, we gotta prescribe them, we gotta, so they don't, if we bring our own, like I always keep them in a bag, same thing, at the door ready to go, at least you know, two doses worth, so that, that way when we get there, they're, we're not waiting for them to try to, you know, put the prescription together. Yeah, the list. and a lot of times the hospitals are really big sticklers about not wanting you to use your home medications, but I feel like things over the counter, you, especially if you can get in touch with the palliative care doctor at the hospital, they can help advocate for you to be able to keep your kid on the same schedule that they are at home and, you know, to use similar meds that are like normally in their routine. And so what other types of things do you have in the bag, too, that you're thinking of? I'm, I'm thinking for me, like, you know, comfy socks and um, deodorant. <laughs> um, like you said, that they don't yeah. Their, their food. Don't forget oh, yeah, food. extra food. That's another thing, too, if yeah. your child has equipment to bring it to the hospital If you have you. special food, bring it, because yeah, I can guarantee your hospital They're won't not have, have it. They're not going to have it. Um, you know, if you have a feeding pump, feeding bring pump. the feeding pump. I've done that. Um, my son, I told you, had a, we use laryngectomy supplies. The hospital oh, yeah. the floor that we use doesn't have them. Um, all the different things that you are going to be asked to do or you want there, like you want snacks, you need your phone charger, you need oh, yeah. change of clothes for you. Um, just have everything prepacked. And if you go to the hospital... Um, and, you're, and you're remembering, um, uh, start making a list of, yeah. wish, I wish I had this, I wish I had so that, we need time, this, have it. and then have it, and, and make sure that the next time, that's in your bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. All right, anything else? I know the Zoom meeting is done, but if anyone else wants to talk about anything.